Welcome to Ion Business Innovation, where we look at innovative companies, innovative products, and the innovative people. And tonight we have two special guests with us, Jacob and Sarah from Flywire, all the way from Hawaii. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Hey, Shannon. Thanks for having us. So maybe first thing, tell us how you got started in this uh, little venture. Sure. Do you want to take it? Go I can. ahead. <laughs> sure. Um, so my background uh, has been in engineering. So okay. I've been an engineer now since undergrad for about 10 years. Uh, and it's part of that always I enjoyed kind of tinkering on the side, helping people with, with side projects, things like that. And I would had an opportunity to do a little bit of work um, with some video cameras, playing around with it. And while I was basically in the basement working on it, uh, Sarah, who's been real plugged into you know a lot of new technology, especially in the biology area, kind of realized right away that there was some real compelling use cases if we could kind of get it dialed in just right. And uh, it's basically kind of how it started. Okay. Now, Sarah, tell us about the actual product and the name of the company and all that stuff that I forgot to mention. Oh, uh, well, the company is Wearwear, right? Mm -hmm. And fly, um, and then the camera is Flywire. Mm -hmm. And what does it do? It uh, basically is a small HD camera that films in 1080p. Um, it's got a wide-angle lens, and you can basically wear it. Um, and get a first-person perspective like I have now on my glasses, or um, you can basically mount it anywhere you want. So this is Flywire on your yes, face it your is. head right yep. now? Yep, okay. right, on this, right on my glasses. And so what do you two see as the main uses of this? You know, one of the design decisions we made early on with this, as opposed to some of the traditional things that are out there, is that if we didn't want to pair, uh, we didn't want to build, you know, a camera that was in a pair of glasses or a camera that was in a helmet or something like that. So with Flywire, you can take it off the glasses, you could put it onto another accessory that you own, a pair of goggles, into a helmet, you could set it up as a portable security camera, really whatever you want to do. But kind of the most compelling things that we're getting back from our customers early on is really for coaching and training and then a lot kind of in the personal recording space because with the camera in between your eyes you can basically videotape your memory now which is pretty pretty interesting for people. Now you're also working with several different professional groups as I understand it. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the possibilities there? Um, right, um, well we are we're working with Accelerate UH. Okay. Um, it's a business accelerator out of Hawaii and um, they've been helping us kind of get our business model um, okay. kind of up to speed and things like that. Um, helping us with um, you know kind of networking in the community. Yeah yes. so law enforcement has been big obviously that's real trendy um, yes. with some of the current events that have been going on the move to video in that sector but also, I think in a lot of other professional spaces, medical is kind of a big one, but even yeah. some of the things people wouldn't think about, for instance, uh, for legal. I mean, we've had lawyers, attorneys that have used them to go walk through a crime scene to reenact what their client saw and right. be able to present that in front of a jury. So okay. it's really kind of a, a pretty broad spread. Right. And we're, uh, you know, also some applications in psychology um, as well as biology. Um, now, will there come a time when, you know, Every one of us will have one of these, you know, like we have an iPhone, we'll have a flywire set of glasses and we can film the kids or the dog and cat or I think so. Yeah. I think so. Uh, yeah, I think one of our, our big big picture goals with the company actually is to not, not develop kind of a, a standalone product that exists in its own world, but really develop kind of a, a the next big companion device that works kind of in okay. the internet of things with the other things you have and can work for you at work or home or, or travel with you no matter what you do or where you go. And compare it and integrate it with your existing equipment yeah. as well if you like. Yeah. Now what I remember you folks talking about is it's modular, miniature, and there's a couple other M's in there somewhere. <laughs> uh, a lot of alliteration. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but tell us about the various components of the, of the whole setup. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so what we did with it, Sarah's got it on, um, is basically you've got... You say it. It's the camera right here, right? Yep, yep, the camera portion. So kind of at the core of the camera, you've got a camera module yep. uh, that's connected by a cable of kind of whatever length people need uh, to a DVR box that actually okay. does the onboard recording. Um, okay. And then you've got external microphones that you can use. So you can yeah. use whatever audio source, you can use whatever video source, and basically you can kind of mix and match to create packages that are tailored for specific applications. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what's the what's the advantage or disadvantage of using this over the other products that exist? Well, sure. Out there? I mean you spend a lot of time wearing it. I'd be curious to see kind of your take on it. <laughs> well, I think there's a major advantage, especially if you'd like line of sight perspective, you know, in the size and um, the weight of it. 
you know, wearing other competitors on your head. It's bigger. It's cumbersome. Um, it, it actually moves. If you're doing a lot of activity, you're moving. The, their uh, other cameras will move. Ours is stays a little more stationary. Um, but I mean, it's it's so flexible. Like you know, I mean, you could you could wear it as on your glasses. You, you yeah. like we've talked about. You can put it on the wall. We, we could put it on a. Uh, make an animal tag, put it on animal, you know, so critter you have, cams. So you have the uh, frame with, with no lenses in it right now, but I right. can take that same camera and attach it to my glasses. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep. So yeah, you can do your personal glasses as well. Right. Yep. Okay. I think one of the other interesting things we've, we've started getting back from people too is, you know, looking at moving beyond the traditional form factor of what people associate with a camera. Yeah. Because when you move into wearable space, I mean, it's really kind of a new genre of how people interact and use technology. And, and one of the things people like with this particular form factor is that our users, our customers get to choose the exact video perspective they get. They can choose the exact audio source that they get. And then they can put the controls in a place that's easy to reach and work with, which is an experience you don't necessarily get with a lot of systems that are out there today. So that's the modularity, and you can you know, mix mm -hmm. and match and arrange these things however you want to. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what's the, I know this is kind of the first generation project. Mm -hmm. um, you willing to share with our audience what's up next for Flywire? Is that? Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, so, you know, a little bit on it without <laughs> giving away, you know, giving away the farm. But um, kind of what we're looking at um, moving beyond just local onboard recording, which is what we're doing now, is moving into being able to talk to other devices. So, you know, again, that concept of the Internet of Things. So that basically you can use a Flywire and, for instance, if, if you were a doctor, okay. you could take your Flywire you to home. I was a doctor? Yeah. <laughs> you <laughs> are yeah. a doctor. <laughs> Medical doctor. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. So if you're going into an OR with some of the other doctors we work with, you know, you could use your Flywire and turn it on, and as you walked into the hospital, you would be picked up by the hospital's network, and you'd be instantly connected through the existing software of that hospital for telemedicine or whatever else you wanted to do. Okay. And then when you left work, you could go to watch one of your sons and your son or your daughter's baseball or volleyball game and say, if it, you know, if it was a female doctor, her husband's running late, he can pull up on his tablet and watch that game through her perspective at the same time their grandparents could throw it up with, you know, go Chromecast or Apple Play and watch it on TV. So, yeah. Now, um, you all have been obviously uh, very... Uh entrepreneurial entrepreneurs, <laughs> um, what are the lessons you've learned along the way on your path that you might want to share with our audience? We've got some entrepreneurs out there watching this. So. Yeah. Um, as a, someone who's new to this type of industry, um, I think the biggest thing that I've learned is that it takes longer than you think it will. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it's every day. And it's every day. All day, every day. Yep. day. So <laughs> that's, that's mine. What about you? What about you? Right. Um, you know, I think, to be honest, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work. Um, you know, it's a lot of up and down as you go through it. But I, I think the opportunity uh, to be in a community where you're doing new things in fun, creative spaces is really rewarding for the people that want to put, put the time and effort into it. Now, any final coaching messages you'd like to give to our audience? Anything you'd recommend that they do that you know, you've learned about? Sure. Uh, you have anything off you the top of your head? Not off the top. How about you? <laughs> I mean, yeah. off the bottom. <laughs> the bottom. Well, I, think, I think, honestly, um, you know, one thing that really helps is doing your research, not necessarily on the product and the market and all that stuff, but, but kind of seeking out and surrounding yourself with a good team of advisors, you know, people mm -hmm. that can give you coaching and direction when, when you don't have all the answers. Yeah. Sounds good. Well, really appreciate having you on the show. Thank you so and much for having us. Yeah, venture. thanks, man. Thank this you. Been great. Thank you. You have been watching Eye on Business Innovation, where we look at innovative companies, innovative products, and innovative people. Hi, my name is Jacob Isaac Lowry, CEO of Flywire, and this is Sarah Alessi, and you're watching Eye on Business. I'm Kevin McDonald, the producer and host of Eye on Business and Facets Television, and I want to thank the crew and all of you. Thanks for watching. Hi, I'm Brandon McNeil for Eye on Productions, and make sure and keep an eye out for the Ask Dino Show, the innovation segment, and the new Cutting Edge Facets TV. Hello, this is Jim Gray. I am a retired judge of the Orange County Superior Court, and you are with me in a judge's chambers. 
Today I would like to talk to you about a program that regardless of what your political philosophy is, it's not working. And that is, from my own observations and involvement, the death penalty. You know something? Again, whether you are conservative and you want to have people executed for sometimes very heinous offenses, or you feel that that's just not appropriate for the state to execute or kill people, it isn't working. What is happening is that we have hundreds and hundreds of people, thousands of people around the country that have been on death row for 10 years, 20 years, even 30 years, and it simply is not having anything occur. So why? Well, honestly, from the court system, we're too compassionate a people, and I think that's a good thing. We want to make sure that all of these defendants have all of the protections that the Constitution can give them, and here in California, that means it takes at least 10 to 15 years to go through the trial itself, if they're convicted, then go through the appellate process in the state, and then after that, it starts all over again with the federal government. Do I think that's appropriate? Yes, I do. However, what is really happening here is the victims, the ones who are supposedly foremost in our mind, the people that are left behind, the family members, the grieving folks, are actually penalized. They're taken advantage of politically, and they have to go through this waiting period for decades. I myself was involved in one preliminary hearing for a really bad guy who was eventually killed, excuse me, he was uh, convicted of three murders. That was in 1987. He was convicted in 1988, and he's still on death row, not even close to having this appellate process finished. And that isn't even talking about what the state's going to do as far as the various cocktails, etc., to have this occur. In the meantime, you're not aware of this, but conservatively speaking, it costs us as taxpayers sometimes about seven to eight times the amount of money to keep a person in this process than it would to convict this person of an LWAP, that is a life without possibility of parole, and the appellate process, and keep that person in prison for the rest of his or her life, seven to eight times more. So once again, this just isn't working. To finish the comment, in Orange County and, Cal and in Los Angeles County, within a month of each other, there was the legitimate outrageous situation in which the defendants were convicted of the underlying charges and then requested the death penalty, which the jury gave to them. Why? Well, it's a better life. You know, if you're on death row, you have half again as large a cell. You don't have a roommate, so you have a bigger place for yourself. You get more television rights, more library rights, more visitation rights. It's a better life, and they're not executed anyway. So regardless of your of views, let's abolish the death penalty. Just abolish it. Our country couldn't even join the European Union if we had death penalty in, in the United States of America. So let's abolish it and do something a lot smarter, which is life without possibility of parole. That's what I think for my judges' chambers. Give it some thought. This is Jim Gray. I'll see you again soon. Welcome. I'm Kevin McDonald, and you're watching Facets Television. And with me tonight is a young woman who has an amazing story. We're going to call it Riker's story, though, however. A little bit of background is Allison Doyle, who's with us tonight, actually took control of and the caring of a young boy by the name of Riker. The thing about it is that Riker was abandoned. She has taken it upon herself to take care of Riker. And what we want to talk about, especially today, is after doing that brave thing, what situation she's found herself in with the county and other representatives that make life difficult for her. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having me, Kevin. So. Let me hear a little bit about how you ended up coming into the custody and care of Riker. Sure. So approximately two and a half years ago, Riker was abandoned by both of his parents who have a bad addiction problem. Mm -hmm. They both have other children that are all adopted out, a total of seven, including Riker. And unfortunately, uh, he was in their care, and one evening they left and they never came back. And how long ago was that? That was two and a half years ago. How old is Riker now? He's now three. He turned three in June, and he's the love of my life. So now, this, how is he in relation to you? I know he's family, but what part of he the family? He is family. So he is my cousin first removed, which is what I've learned now having to sign so many documents. That is um, our true relationship. First cousin once removed. All right. So you decide 
rather than to allow him to go back into the foster system, that you're going to take it upon yourself to take care of this little boy? Absolutely. It just was not an option. So um, what ended up happening was we tried to contact the birth parents. So I, I've got a great partner, um, Craig, who's amazing. We're not married yet, but we would love to be. <laughs> and um, this little boy was in our it was in our care and we tried to contact the parents and they just never responded to us. At the end of the day, uh, the birth father ended up sending a text message saying, I'm sorry, I messed up again. And really? that was it. That's the response to abandoning his child? Absolutely. Okay. So our, there were two options for us. It was one, get social services involved. What they do is they come in, they remove the child from your home, mm -hmm. they go into a foster care wherever that may be may bounce around from foster to foster home mm -hmm. or to move forward with an adoption never crossed my mind not to move forward with the adoption he's gonna stay in our family and that's just the way it's gonna be and I will fight for him till the end of days so let's uh, what I need is for you folks to understand how convoluted this is if Ali had decided to give up Riker and allow them to pull him into the foster care system, which anybody who's followed the foster care system, in general, social services and foster care is probably the last per place you want a child um, if there are anybody in the family that's available. But because you didn't allow them to take him and put him into the foster system, what are you having to do in order to go through this process? So at this point, I do not qualify for any state aid. So just from the state alone, I have to pay them $4,500. For what? What that includes is a, uh, assigned, um, an assigned um, CSS agent. Mm -hmm. And what she does is come to your home and do an inspection. Mm -hmm. She also conducts an interview. Mm -hmm. But the real part is that she goes out and she interviews the parents. She collects documents from them. And then also about 107 pages of documents that I have to provide with background checks, medical, um, mm -hmm. credit checks, etc. So I have to pay for them to abandon their child. Makes absolutely no so sense. So let me, so let's frame this in the way, that, I mean, if you're not catching this, if the state had taken control and spent tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars of our taxpayer money to put him into a system where foster parents are paid, where they have to do all these investigations and instead of doing a home inspection and saying your family here you go uh, and now because of the adoption situation if you were indigent or you had allowed that situation to occur you wouldn't be paying any of these fees correct. is that correct? I could have just let him go into a foster care we could have just used the state's money and then for the rest of his life a social worker would follow him it would cost all of us extra money mm -hmm. but I chose not to do that route I was not willing to have him taken out of our home and again feel like he was abandoned. Mm -hmm. He was 15 months old. Yeah. I'm not going to let a baby go into somebody, some stranger's home, whether they're great people or not, mm -hmm. when it's my family. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way it is. So what has their response been to the frustration? Because, I mean, you know, you're a middle class family. You don't have a lot of money. Absolutely. You don't just write checks for $4,500, <laughs> right? Nope. So. There's a reset button that I understand. If you can't come up with that money in a short period of time, you have to start this whole process over Absolutely. again? Absolutely. So uh, we have a great social worker, and uh, she was more than willing to escalate the situation to her manager. Mm -hmm. there, there is actually um, a form that you can fill out to ask them to either waive the fee or ask them to reduce the fee. Unfortunately, I didn't qualify for either because I have a stable job and make the median income in Orange County. Mm -hmm. So, um, basically, I'm stuck with that $4,500. Now, there's an allotted time. So, I only have so many months to get all of this paperwork in. Mm -hmm. And then, in addition to that, make sure that I get with my attorney, get the appropriate doc, um, documents filed and signed and served to both sets of the birth parents. And if I don't do that in a reasonable amount of time, according to them, they will provide you a couple of extensions. You lose all your money and you start from day one. So you're them. hearing this? A woman who wants to take care of a member of her family who has basically rescued this young boy Riker from what, in my opinion, is the nightmare of the foster system and 
they're making it to the point where if she can't afford it, he's going to end up in that system anyway, and we're all going to pay for it. He's going to end up less likely to have a reasonably good life because foster care does not have good statistics. We all know that. This is insanity. I mean, it's complete insanity. It's where we're stuck. And the $4,500, that is just what goes to the state, my friends. Right. That is right. not my legal bills. That doesn't include overnight becoming a mother and not knowing what I'm doing. I didn't have a stroller. I didn't have a car seat. I didn't know where I was going to put him in the school. Daycare. Yeah. Daycare. Yeah. Diapers. When do I feed him? Mm -hmm. I didn't know any of that. I just learned by family, by people supporting me um, in terms of, you know, emotional. And we just moved on from there. Again, I have a great partner, and he's been nothing short of amazing. But unfortunately, we're not millionaires. We don't so, have silver spoons. So let me ask you this. What drives somebody to put yourself, I mean, this is quite a position to put yourself in, and, and we could say it's family and all, but a lot of people let their family go into the foster care system. What drives you, Allison Doyle, to make this decision to up upend your life this way? Uh, I'm very passionate because um, his real grandmother, who um, had passed when I was six years old, she was like a second mother to me, and it almost makes me want to cry. Um, and sh my mother was a single mother, and I basically was with her she was my daycare mm -hmm. and she was like an angel and she passed away uh, unfortunately when I was very young so really one in honor of her um, I want to a lot of my morals and values come from her right and I see that in Riker and he wants he is and you, he just exudes this greatness about him and I there's a piece of me inside of him that I'm mm -hmm. just not willing to let anybody else have so I understand that you did a, a Kickstarter or, or uh, another way to try to raise the money to try to help? My mother did, yes. Very fortunate. Um, she just, you know, with all the anxiety and everything that happens um, every night, it's very hard to sleep. So she was so generous in starting up um, a GoFundMe.com yeah. um, site where people can donate. To, to try help. to help you get out from under this yes. and not have to start this whole process again. Yes. Yeah. And so um, at this point, we've raised $3,000, which I am so beyond gracious for, all the support that has helped me. And yeah. I really appreciate everybody. And, and thanks to you for being here. Oh, no. You know what? I got to tell you, I, I think this is completely insane. And the idea that we as a society are allowing a system to be set up, that we are doing everything we can from stopping her from doing what's right, I think it's outrageous. With that said, I want to wish you the best of luck. Thank and you Thank so you much. so much for sharing your story with us tonight. Thank you. I'm Kevin McDonald, and you've been watching Facets Television, and with me tonight was Allison Doyle and her little boy, Riker, and thank you for watching. Thank you. This is Allie Doyle, and you're watching Facets Television. Okay. I'm Erin Runyon, and you're watching Facets Television. Three. Hello, my name is Jim Gray. I'm a retired judge from the Orange County Superior Court in California, and you are with me in a judge's chambers. Let's talk about the political reality for the criminal justice system, because the voters and members of the legislature have been really getting tough on crime, supposedly, for the last 10, 20, even 30 years. And what's happened? It really has not worked. What we have really done is clogged the courts, the jails, and the prisons with low-level offenders, and we are simply not realizing the fact that the tougher you get with regard to nonviolent crime, the softer you get with regard to the prosecutions of robbery, rape, and murder. And so as a result, we are simply sinking in the court system as a result of all of this. Fortunately, the voters around the country are getting smarter. Here in California, you're probably aware that we passed Proposition 47 to delete mostly a possession of narcotics, for example, from a felony to a misdemeanor, not involving now going to state prison, but instead staying in your local jails. That's a really good idea. We're saving millions, tens of millions of dollars in doing this, and the voters had the foresight to say, okay, let's spend some of this money on areas in which we can help ourselves. That is, with mental health in the prisons, mental health out of the prisons, or with education and things like that. 
You're probably not aware of this, but you should be. Pretty much every county in our country has its largest mental health facility, namely as the local county jail, doing untold damage to these mentally fragile people. Let's stop that and put the money into resources that will actually assist them in living better, more productive lives. We can do this. We are doing it here in Orange County. I recommend it to you as well. If you're interested in your county, contact me, Judge Jim Gray. Com. I will respond to you by email and give you the information that you need. These are programs that work. They're not only more compassionate, they're better for the taxpayer, they're better for everybody except, honestly, the prison guards union. I think we can all not shed a tear for that one. So that's what I think from my judges' chambers. Give it some thought. We'll talk about this idea and more next time. Stay tuned.